Uh, my name is Jose Vergara, and I teach here in the Russian section, if you don't know. Um, and I'd, first of all, I'd just like to thank you all for, for attending today um, this talk by Alexander Kondakov. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, um, I really should take this opportunity to thank the Sager Series and the Cooper Foundation for making this event possible. Um, so big thanks to them, and then also extend my gratitude to our many co-sponsors and co-promoters. Um, history, represented by Bob Weinberg here. Uh, linguistics, anthropology, sociology, religion, libraries, and the Swarthmore Project for East European Relations, um, which if you don't know and you're a student, you should find out more about this organization that's bringing a lot of interesting speakers to campus. Roman here, Roman, is the one to talk to if you want to know more. Um, and I think this big list of sponsors and people that are supporting this talk today really speaks to the, to the relevance and significance of what we're going to learn more about. Um, not only for Russia, but our broader campus community as well. And finally, I'll mention to the students that we have copies of uh, Gay Propaganda here, this book, um, for you to have after the talk. Um, and if any adult adults also want a copy, there might be enough left over as well. Um, so, uh, Alexander Kondakov is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the Finnish Center for Russian and East European Studies at the University of Helsinki. He has previously held positions at European University in St. Petersburg, the Center for Independent Social Research in St. Petersburg as well, and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, for decades, his work has been primarily focused on law and sexuality studies, specifically on queer sexualities in Russia. He has published over two dozen articles, maybe more, um, on topics including LGBTQ political strategies, queer urban spaces and coalitions, teaching queer theory, heteronormativity and legal discourse, BDSM practices, and migration policies in Russia. So this wide range of topics. Um, and his research has been er, supported rather by a number of uh, uh, sources, including the MacArthur Foundation, uh, the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, and the Norwegian Institute for Urban and Regional Research. Um, so he's doing great stuff. Uh, and his talk today uh, concerns, in general, how laws might be manipulated to oppress already at-risk populations and how Russia has become um, even more so or continues to be this land of doublespeak, of dangerous euphemisms. Um, in particular, I have in mind, perhaps um, Alexander will speak about this, uh, what uh, the Russian President Vladimir Putin said, um, that being gay in Russia is not a crime. Um, and in the same breath, he went on to defend this law uh, that was adopted in two, uh, f four years ago or so that outlawed any public discussion of homosexuality or related topics. Um, and it was painted as this um, law that would protect children against child abuse, pedophilia, um, kind of activating or reactivating this terrible and terribly misguided link that many uh, many people and groups have made in the past. Um, and as we'll learn, the situation is much worse than that. So please join me in welcoming Alexander Kondakov. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for having me here and uh, for giving this great opportunity to, to speak to you and to discuss the current developments in um, regulation of sexuality and uh, the effects that different laws may have on uh, society, on Russian society, right? And in particular, the law banning propaganda of uh, what we now call non traditional sexual relations, right? So um, I, I, I want to, to use this opportunity to, uh, well, to actually as a starting point for maybe a larger discussion on what is actually going on in Russia, yes, in relation to sexuality and queer sexuality in particular. So um, I can talk about this uh, research that I'm doing now uh, for, for quite some, some time already and I think that it uh, is broad enough to actually cover a lot of different topics related to sexuality and homosexuality in particular. But uh, I will focus on one particular issue, violence uh, against LGBT 
populations in Russia, right? And uh, the idea of the research really starts with the uh, federal legislation uh, on, on propaganda uh, of what they call non-traditional sexual relations, right? So uh, the uh, history of that particular law uh, is uh, lasting, let's say, right? So it started in 2006 uh, with the first regional propaganda law, homosexual propaganda law, uh, that was adopted in Rezan. It's a region not far from Moscow, and it, it wasn't a big issue, actually. Nobody knew the law existed until uh, activists discovered its existence in 2009, right? And, and the law um, actually arrived to the constitutional and Supreme Court level as they wanted to challenge it, uh, but before that, nobody knew it uh, even existed. Well, uh, anyway, the uh, the path the path of that law to the federal level started in 2006, right? And in uh, 2013, it finally arrived to the Duma, to the Russian Parliament, where uh, it was first of all modified, right? So uh, the law actually lost its a clear language that it had before in the regions uh, when they were prohibiting uh, homosexuality or uh, homosexuality, lesbianism, bisexuality, and transgenderism, as they call it in St. Petersburg in uh, 2012, right? And here it was different. It was already this uh, idea, a very new actually for Russia, uh, of non traditional sexual. Uh, relations and as you see, uh, the law bans dissemination of information. So we shouldn't uh, kind of uh, we should distinguish right the the criminality uh, that sometimes is attached to queer relationships from this particular thing, which is a censorship law, right? Censorship law that prohibits dissemination of information, and at the same time, actually. Uh, produces a lot of interest to uh, write and to read about uh, LGBT issues, which is, uh, which is the case in Russia, of course. So the law does have a lot of different effects, a lot of different results or outcomes. One of them is definitely uh, the growth of information related to LGBT issues in Russia today. Another one is... Uh, um, uh, and this is the uh, actual uh, kind of focus of my research, is growth of violence against LGBT people in Russia. Uh, initially, when uh, people, uh, especially politicians, commented on this law, they said that there is no big deal. As you uh, actually mentioned, Jose, uh, Vladimir Putin himself uh, said that it's not a big deal. It's just... Uh, just just a law uh, that doesn't prohibit anything, that doesn't prohibit, as he says, uh, non-traditional forms of sexual interaction, right? But uh, it's just, uh, just the law that uh, kind of withdraws certain information from public, uh, uh, from public domain, right? And he specifically mentioned that nobody grabs people on the streets, uh, there's no violence against gay people or lesbian people, uh, women in, in Russia, but uh, uh, so, so, so he invites actually everybody to come to Russia, yeah, you can feel yourself peaceful and comfortable there, but just leave the kids alone, right? So this was the point. And we, uh, with, a, uh, with a group of researchers that I supervised here, some information on this research, and the research team we decided to uh, to check that kind of sentiment to 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 learn whether it's true, whether actually the law doesn't influence on the level of violence, on the idea of some people to attack uh, other people just for being gay, right? So we we decided to to do that and to uh, to not to challenge Vladimir, right? But just to, to learn whether or not he uh, 
he uh, has the point. And so we decided to, uh, to find out how many hate crimes uh, were there before the introduction of the law in 2013 and how many are there after yeah, 2013. And actually, uh, we found out that uh, the law that um, the law on hate crime in Russia is very, very rich. It's actually very well developed. And there's a specific article in criminal code that um, uh, states that commitment of a crime motivated by political, ideological, racial, ethnic, or religious hatred, or by hatred towards any one social group is an aggravating circumstance in any crime, right? So uh, this is a very important thing, right? And, and social group uh, is, uh, is a very broad category that may include LGBT communities, right? And actually there is a Supreme Court decision that says that yes, you have to include what they call uh, uh, communities based on non-traditional sexual orientation into that particular category of social group. And there are other laws in criminal code of Russia that say, uh, so commitment of a murder or of physical injury, of uh, hooliganism or, or even hate speech, right, may be aggravated by these same uh, motives, motives of hate. And so we've taken a look how those different articles of criminal code are applied to actual cases. And starting from 2010 to 2016, we have found four cases where those articles were applied uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, the episodes, in the incidents that involved uh, gay men, right? In, in those four particular cases, th those were gay men. And moreover, three of those cases were written by, by the same judge in the Moscow region. So the application of the law is not that um, uh, rich, let's say. So we decided to uh, dig deeper and we went to uh, two databases of court decisions in Russia uh, where all court decisions from all over Russia are published. So there is one official database of court decisions that is maintained by uh, the Ministry of Justice in Russia. You can just go there and download any court decision from any region you can only imagine. And there is a, uh, res uh, there is search engine that will help you to uh, to single out the cases that you want. And there, is, and there was another independent database uh, of court decisions that were um, collected by attorneys, right? so by lawyers. So we went there in, into those databases and uh, uh, we started to search for every case that mentions anything non-traditional. Right? And uh, we've also used, uh, with uh, uh, lower success, uh, some other uh, keywords. But this non-traditional was one of the major uh, notions that helped us to, to, uh, to single out those, those cases. Uh, of course, we had to get rid of other non-traditional stuff, like, I don't know, non-traditional medicine, non-traditional uh, oil extraction. This is a big uh, thing there. So uh, all, all other non-traditional things that are also in those da databases. But uh, eventually, we have found 3,000 cases that somehow uh, relate yeah, to LGBT, to queer uh, topics, to queer themes. Not all of those cases were cases about uh, violence against queer people, right? Some of them were, uh, well, for uh, one, one of the major categories was uh, this, um, when police officers were offended, uh, when they were called by uh, some homosexual epithets, right? And, and they uh, sued the person who uh, offended them. So th that was, I think, a, a more or less a thousand cases were those, right? 
then the, there were other, uh, other cases like the uh, actual enforcement or implementation of propaganda cases is also there. And uh, finally, there were almost 300 cases of starting from 2010 to 2016 that I think are hate crime cases, right, in that particular database. And they come from almost all over Russia. So the uh, regions in, in, in white are uh, those particular regions where we do have uh, cases, where we do have court decisions. And the gray regions are um, regions without hate crime uh, decisions in our database. It, uh, here I just want to, uh, you know, for you to understand that it doesn't mean that those regions are uh, wonderful rainbow regions where you can uh, go and, and feel yourself uh, comfortable as uh, Vladimir Putin suggests. No, right? Th those are regions where we just don't have the data. Right? So perhaps uh, judges there are so embarrassed about sexuality, so embarrassed to talk about sexuality that they don't even mention it in their uh, texts, in the texts of court decisions that they take there. Or there is some other stuff going on. Of course, uh, the, um, uh, the cases that I have that, that, that are in this uh, database and that are included in this research are the cases that arrive to the final point of uh, their uh, criminal career. Right? So the cases were reported to the police, the police actually took the report seriously, there was investigation, uh, the investigation concluded uh, successfully and was uh, given to the prosecutor's office and the prosecutors took it to the court and the court decided that the case worth hearing and, and, and the uh, court finally took the decision, right? Uh, and the judge has written a sentence. Uh, and and, and so, so there are many, 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 many stages and at each stage something could happen. Most uh, importantly at the initial stage of the case. Well, when uh, reports of violence are not taken seriously and simply don't go to the system. So, looking at those 300 cases, I was uh, trying to, um, to find more or less this, right? The, the uh, uh, operational definition of a hate crime in, uh, in Russia. Uh, there are three important elements. So, it is supposed to be a, a criminal offense, right? So, uh, the judges have to apply criminal law. This is one thing. Then, uh, sexuality of the victim should also be there, right, in the text. It, 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 it should be somehow mentioned, otherwise the cases will not be, uh, will not be exposed to, to my regard. And finally, the uh, defendants, the perpetrators, they had to somehow explain that the, the victim wasn't a casual victim, that's just any person, but it's somehow related to the victim's sexuality, right? The, uh, there is a, an element of prejudice, of bias, in, uh, in the decision of uh, the perpetrator to commit uh, violence. And I will now guide you through some cases just to show how uh, how the, 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 the work, the analysis, uh, has been done. And first of all, I will show you uh, the cases that I had to withdraw from, from my sample, right? Because they discussed this. And I will uh, read you the text. So, the court uh, denies the version of defense that the victim uh, threatened by commitment of actions of sexual character towards the defendant. Because according to witness testimonies, the victim did not have any expression of non-traditional sexual orientation. He was characterized positively, enjoyed authority and respect among his colleagues and sportsmen. He was married and had children, and when drinking alcohol, he acted calmly, right? So here we have, first of all, uh, the idea that you can claim that you uh, assaulted a gay person 
and get away with the murder, right? Or uh, with, with, with uh, a, a, a criminal offense, any criminal offense. But this didn't work in this particular case, right? The judge said no. But also, there is a very specific notion of heterosexuality here, right? So, uh, for example, a, a gay man cannot be respected by sportsmen, right? So sports and, and, and gays doesn't go along well in the mind of the judge. Uh, marriage, children, of course, family, something different. And, and certainly, when uh, gay people drink, they do not behave calmly, right? They, they behave uh, in a different kind of way, I guess. So there is, there is that. And, and there is a particular vision of respectful sexuality, which is equated to heterosexuality. Those cases were taken away. Now, uh, another uh, way of, of, um, uh, of dealing with sexuality in those texts, in the texts of court decision, was just to note it, but uh, do nothing about it. It's just part of the case, but the judge doesn't think that it's uh, somehow relevant or, or interesting or important for the case. Like in this uh, instance, for example, in mid-February, the defendant drove a car with certain registration number which he used to deliver taxi services. And he met the victim to whom he gave his phone number. The victim occasionally texted to the defendant and informed him about his non-traditional sexual orientation, because of which the defendant developed unpleasant feelings towards the victim. And on certain dates, uh, he assaulted him, right? So he created this criminal plan, plan and uh, assaulted the victim. So uh, I think that it's important to comment maybe something on it, right? Because it's clear, even from this narrative, that sexuality has something to do with the crime. Right? But then, apart from mentioning this in, in this kind of explanation, judge doesn't uh, uh, take it further. Right? But uh, for my research, it was important to, uh, to have those, uh, those cases in the sample. And uh, also from this text, I guess you can understand that there is a certain translation being made when, when, when writing the text from a kind of language of normal people to legal language. Right? I don't think that in Krasnoyarsk, people just text occasionally to uh, taxi drivers and inform them about non-traditional sexual orientation, right? All, all that. Uh, but this is how the uh, narrative of a court decision should be developed, right? And this is how it, it goes. And I will uh, talk about it a little bit more in uh, a little bit later. Then there is actually collection of testimonies, right? So judges, if the, uh, sexuality is important, they have to collect testimonies to find out and establish in the courtroom that the person assaulted, that the victim is actually a gay man or, or, or a lesbian woman. Like here, the defendant intentionally committed light damage to health that caused short period upset of health and it was motivated by hatred towards any one social group. The crime was committed in the following circumstances on the 21st of June, 2011, about uh, 11 p.m., Name One and himself were standing near a building where they met the victim, who, as he knew, was a person of non-traditional sexual orientation, a homosexual. Because of this, the defendant started to plot criminal action directed to cause harm to health of the victim. The court reviewed testimony of the victim who stated that he had uh, been a person of non-traditional sexual orientation since he was 20. He had entered in sexual intercourse with other men as a passive partner. He did this voluntarily. So they reviewed uh, testimony of the victim, right? And there is, again, in comparison to heterosexuality, there is a different notion of sexuality here, right? So first of all, uh, a ma male homosexuality has to have a starting point, right? At this, uh, in this particular instance, it's at the age of 20, right? At the age of 20, a person, this particular person, realized he was gay. 
This is one thing. Then, um, somehow, male homosexuality is related to passivity, right? right? So, passive partner is not just, you know, uh, a, an establishment or, of a legal fact or anything, but it's a very important notion, very important element of, of, of understanding of, of male homosexuality in this particular legal discourse. And um, uh, I think when we look at the definition of lesbian sexuality, we can see it even with more uh, clarity, because here the victim's mother, I quote, testified in the courtroom that her daughter was an active, right, lesbian. Uh, though she kept details of her pers personal life in secret from her, she was keen on fishing and on certain days she bought a knife. So, passivity is related to male homosexuality, whereas activity, activeness is related to female homosexuality, to lesbian uh, relationship. And of course, as you see, lesbian relationships are al also associated with uh, manly things like a hobby of fishing, and of course, a possession of weapon, right, a knife. So uh, I was looking at these uh, sort of uh, narratives, uh, at these definitions to establish uh, how judges understand sexuality, how they treat sexuality in their courts room. Uh, there were other instances, they, they were also collecting like physical evidences, like for example, they could review the victim's uh, DVD collection and see whether or not they have uh, gay porn uh, uh, in, in possession of their home. So that would be another uh, way to establish sexuality. And they were even forensic expertise involved in some cases. So there are various ways to do so. But uh, the testimonies uh, are uh, the major thing, the m main kind of way to do that. The uh, other part is prejudice, right, and hatred. And of course, in, in those cases, there were much, much more emotions at stake than only hatred. I call them uh, violent affections, right? It's some uh, various ways of people to affectionately relate to their victims. And uh, those particular emotions that make people commit violence. And, and I, I singled out some of them, most of them, right? Uh, that people mentioned in the courtroom and then uh, and, and that uh, went uh, eventually to to the um, to the g decision right to the court decision to the text of court decision as you see they are various and there are many and and not of them not all of them are uh, obvious sometimes there's fun there is uh, of course also a lot of fear People are scared, and, and that's why they kill. And, and this is uh, another topic. I will show you some of those narratives. Uh, for example, the hatred itself. Of course, it's obviously it's obvious that hatred is there in those core decisions. Like here, basing in motives of hatred to people with non-traditional sexual orientation, homosexuals, and with the aim of realization of his criminal plot, he called the victim filthy words that referred to the victim's sexual orientation. And by doing this, he degraded victims' human dignity. Then, in continuation of his criminal plot, directed to battery of the victim after saying, I hate you so much, you all must be beaten up, he consciously gave not less than three hits with his left fist to the victim's face in the area of his right cheek and mouth that caused pain to victim. The victim shook and collapsed to a chair behind him. As the result of this events of action, the victim felt physical pain and lost several upper right jaw teeth. So, uh, I think it's a classical uh, kind of description of a hate crime, right? A person is motivated by hatred to a particular social group. Then he uh, produces a, a, an enunciation, as says something that I actually hate you and I'm going to uh, beat you up, right? As uh, all of you, so he refers to the group, right? And then he acts upon this uh, promise, right? So um, this is uh, one of the cases, one of the four cases where hatred was recognized in the courtroom. And uh, nevertheless, oh, well, actually, 
uh, most common feeling, most common emotion that judges used in, in, in regard to uh, those cases was, was something they called unpleasant feelings. And this is a, a, a completely different thing. First of all, let me uh, read you this case, right? In this criminal case, the motive of unpleasant feelings to people with non-traditional sexual orientation is supported by the fact that since the moment of emergence of his plan to murder a person with non-traditional sexual orientation, the defendant has selected a specific object, the life of the victim, and then has never pursued other goals such as learning something new from conversations with persons with non-traditional sexual orientation, though according to the data from his email he has had all chances of so doing because he has received many new messages with requests of meetings and conversations. So I would say that if you um, put hate instead of these unpleasant feelings, you will see that it's another classical uh, hate crime right here. But for some reasons, hate is not there. And instead, judges use very uh, weird, clumsy formula, right? unpleasant feelings. Nobody says unpleasant feelings in Russia. Oh, I have unpleasant feelings towards you. No, this is impossible. But, but they use it anyway. So I, I guess that this is a, a sort of legal, uh, how would I say, uh, instead of saying hate, that will, uh, that will bring with it the very mentioning of hate, a certain legal procedure and application of certain norms of certain criminal code articles. Yeah, judges use this thing, this unpleasant feelings, just not to apply the law on hate, on hate crimes. Right? So um, they, they use these unpleasant feelings specifically for that particular reason. And um, moreover, the cases with unpleasant feeling are cases of, uh, you know, much uh, more extreme violence than cases of hatred. If you remember, in, in the previous case of, on, of hatred, there was loss of dignity and uh, a couple of teeth, right? Here, a person was murdered. And still, hate is there and an unpleasant feeling is here. So there is that, uh, that very legal way of dealing with, thi with things, right? And, 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 uh, and making the, uh, the text of decision happening without actually accounting for uh, all the details and, and, and giving a, a, a legal ju uh, justification uh, related to the actual facts of event, right? So there is that. I also included in that, uh, in my sample, cases where victims were specifically selected. Uh, especially, uh, uh, well, most of, of those cases are cases when uh, people were targeted through uh, social networks and, and dating websites, right? So uh, it's another, like this, victim selection is another way to um, identify a, a hate crime, right? In this case, so on certain date, the defendant registered in the social network of Kontakte with a fictional name Sutkov Stanislav where he met a guy with non-traditional sexual orientation named Lisa Blizova, the victim. He offered to his brother and witness one to rob from his person if he came to a meeting with them and had anything valuable with him to which they agreed. This is a very, very common, actually, case yeah? uh, in Russia, especially after 2013 when people learned that they can do that. Th they have found a, a, a group uh, to target. So after applying all those definitions of sexuality, of violent affections, of targeting to my cases, to all those 3,000 cases, right? This is how I got to, to the um, number of 300 and, and finally selected only something that I called hate crimes. And here 
uh, what eventually uh, happened, what, what eventually uh, we've got in terms of numbers of hate crimes. So you see that uh, I didn't include uh, 2010 here, but uh, it was, uh, there were 20 victims in, in 2010. Uh, anyway, you see that in, in 2013, there is a certain rise or growth of the number of episodes and the number of victims uh, in uh, of hate crime in Russia. And, and 2013 is precisely the year of the propaganda law, right? So, uh, moreover, I guess there's, there's also a certain lack of, uh, uh, of those of those cases, of those events, um, uh, as they arrive to, to the final destination of court decision, right? So uh, perhaps they were committed even before when, when the whole discussion started in 2012, right? So uh, the law itself was adopted in, in June 2013, and there were already cases uh, by that date. And, and you see that there is uh, uh, quite essential growth. And, and by 2015, uh, the number of victims actually uh, uh, doubles, right, in, um, in relation to 2012. And I also have uh, distinguished three types of crimes uh, uh, that, that we had there in, in this, in this sam sample. So there, there are murders, there are uh, cases of violence that did not result in uh, fatal um, episodes, in, in, in fatality, and there are cases of uh, different sorts of extortion, robbery, right, uh, these kind of things, wh where people were targeted, but they were victims of, uh, well, say, economical uh, crimes, larceny. And as you see, uh, the number of victims in murder cases also grows uh, by by 2015, and then uh, it goes uh, down in 2016. So probably one of the explanations could be that the effect of the law uh, is fading away. Maybe, yeah. We we still need to to learn more, and uh, um, I'm not sure uh, if it's going to be true, especially given that in in 2017 we've had an outburst of violence in Chechnya, but at the same time, those cases didn't arrive to courts, right? They, they, were, not, um, they were not taken to, to the criminal procedure at all. So it's not clear, but that um, this research is uh, continued, so uh, we'll see what is happening. It's important to, uh, to uh, track that dynamic, right? And uh, one of the points that I also want to mention is that then I also, you know, compared the cases uh, that I call hate crimes with other cases of murder. Uh, uh, in, uh, and, and, and I was calculating whether or not judges give uh, more uh, periods, uh, like sentences are longer in, in the hate crime cases, as they should be if we understand hate crimes as aggravating circumstances or not, right? In comparison to other homicides in Russia, in, to other murders, right? This one particular article of intentional murder that I uh, compared. And uh, I took only cases of homosocial conflicts because I've had them in my sample, right? Th so those are the cases when people um, were offended by uh, discussion of homosexuality, but nobody was an actual gay person there, right? Uh, and they're very similar to, to my uh, hate crime homicides in this sample. And as you see, in hate crimes, actually judges give more than a year more uh, as as the, uh, their sentences than in those homosocial cases, right? And uh, I, I also can say that an average uh, sentence 
for murder in Russia is between eight and nine years, right? Uh, you might say also that it's uh, it's very uh, mild um, country with very mild sentences in these cases. I think in in the U.S. you get life or something, no? Uh, but there it's in between eight and, 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 and nine. And hate crimes are 10.45, uh, so 10 uh, years and six months mo uh, mostly on average. So why is that? Uh, they are, uh, you know, like activist judges who uh, don't recognize hate crime legislation but still um, kind of secretly. Uh, award those uh, longer sentences. This is a possible explanation, right? But I have another one that in many of those cases actually there is extreme violence going on. Extreme violence that uh, kind of makes judges to uh, produce longer sentences. And I will give you one example that I think is very uh, convincing. So on the 16th of February 2014, late night, the defendant was wa waiting for the victim to come out from the house of Z, where they all previously had been drinking alcohol. And motivated by personal unpleasant feelings, by the way, to this person because of his offer to engage in sodomy, he hit his head four times with a nail puller, then he cut off his heart with a knife and took it home where he fried it and ate. This process he shot on his phone camera making comments. Right, so for, for this kind of outburst of violence, of course judges will give longer sentences, right? So maybe the explanation is this. Maybe the explanation is that when people engage in violence uh, based on prejudice related to sexuality, they, uh, they are more violent than uh, in other cases. One final point, and uh, I will stop here, is that uh, this uh, uh, data from core decisions I think is actually very good. Eventually I came to this conclusion because I, I compared it with other uh, data sets from Russia on, on hate crime, like uh, the information that NGOs uh, collect and uh, information that we also collected in, in my uh, research group uh, from media publications, right? We, we uh, collected uh, newspaper articles from every region in Russia and, and were looking for the same, basically, yeah, the um, criminal offenses uh, based on prejudice uh, against LGBT and queer populations. And uh, you see that they look more or less similar. Moreover, the court uh, cases um, actually have a, a kind of smooth uh, line, right? So not like NGOs that, that is always different and, and in this sense very su suspicious, right? So I think that this data is uh, trustworthy and this is a good news. And if it's trustworthy, then another good news is that the violence is now uh, calming down, right? As as we saw in 2016, and uh, there is also one controversial argument uh, that I came up, and I don't think that it actually works out. But I want to share it with you before concluding. That uh, if we relate. Uh, these uh, hate crimes uh, to the population of Russia and compare uh, the same kind of data with the uh, uh, rating from, from the United States, for example, we see that we had actually more or less the same level of violence uh, uh, against queer populations in, in Russia and, and the US before uh, 2013. And in 2013, Russia uh, goes up and, and the U.S. actually goes down. So it sounds weird, a little bit non-convincing, but this is something that to think about, right? And this is something to 
uh, still to be explained. I'm not sure if if these numbers are comparable, but uh, maybe we could discuss it uh, in in questions and answer session because right now I want to stop here. Thank you. would love to I would love to but um, you see it's not clear where to get that data from but first of all those core decisions are uh, definitely not fake first of all right we have to understand that that these are long sentences like 25 30 pages well some of them are shorter but those are huge documents right so nobody would uh, just write uh, fake core decisions. So th this is this is a sort of reliable data, but it has its limitations. You're you're right. Those are only the cases that arrive to the point uh, of this final decision. So we don't have all other cases. Uh, are they all minor offenses? Well, uh, or uh, are they all like very uh, extreme violent cases? No, they're not. There are some uh, cases where. Uh, of battery, for example, right, like, uh, which was decriminalized even in 2016. So uh, the uh, legislators thought that it's not a big deal and um, and eventually decriminalized. It. But before that, we had we had those cases, and those cases were also processed through the criminal procedure, through the criminal uh, justice system. Uh, so, so those are minor offenses, and they are still there. Uh, there are all sorts of cases, and of course, uh, murder is much uh, more frequent because you cannot do anything uh, with a dead body. You have to uh, still get court decision anyway. And then, when when I compared these uh, court cases um, data and results with other so, uh, sources of data. I thought I actually found out that, yeah, it's not that bad. The uh, the core data is actually very good, because in media you don't get uh, more cases; you get more or less the same. Uh, uh, though media probably could report on more uh, on more episodes of violence because they are uh, not biased by or they're not uh, they don't need. A person's report, as police does, right? They they just report on 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 what they see. Activists who uh, actually survey the victims, right? So they survey those people who probably wanted or didn't want to report or wanted but not reported. Right? They they have this data, and still, it's not complete. It's it's even sometimes. In some years, it's even uh, lower than my database. So again, it's a suspicious uh, data. So uh, currently, I think that actually court decisions is is, is good. It's firm. It's uh, it's a good data. And um, but yeah, it, it's still important to compare to to other sources. Here's uh, actually the uh, map of violence based on media reports uh, which uh, we also did but the more uh, different data the better this is true um, thank you for speaking 
Um, I was wondering how you think LGBTQ issues will evolve in Russia as Vladimir Putin continues to hedge the heterosexuality of Oskimi versus the the gay Europa or all the perversion that's mm. in the West. Right. Well. Uh, it's hard to give predictions, certainly, but mm, I, I believe that this argument is uh, not going to work forever. Right? Well, uh, I don't think that Putin personally cares a lot about queer people in any sense. Right? Uh, he did construct his uh, image on a very specific kind of masculinity, which is opposed to queer masculinity, right? So he uh, presents himself in a very manly fashion. Right? He's, a, he's a real man, настоящий мужик, right? Well, it's the claim, right? Actually, he's just a, just a guy, very average person, nothing very special about him, but anyway. This is the image. But then, and, and it's been there for a while already. So at certain point, first, it's supposed to stop working. People stop buying this stuff, right? This is one thing. But then he's also himself bodily getting older, right? And, and it will not be possible to maintain credibility of of this mask masculinity when the king is uh, decaying, when, the, uh, when his body is becoming visibly older. And I think he's already facing that problem. There were also some attempts to reformulate that image somehow, the, the attempts that failed, right? But this is an issue. If, if he's going to stay forever there, He's got to uh, find another way to uh, to to present himself. This this is not going to work for him. I, I I'll repeat. I don't understand how it worked in the first place, right? Because it's it's weird. Some short guy, bald, <laughs> but it worked, right? I cannot deny it. So it, it's going to stop at a certain point. Will he uh, figure out something new, but more or less the same? Like, yeah, you can imagine some some other ways to uh, to engage in in this hyper masculinity imagination, even when physical appearance is is different right or or changing maybe but but again then we 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 come back to the argument that it's not going to work forever the argument is not going to work forever the, the, there are new generation of 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 russians uh coming and and th they they don't watch uh, the first channel. They they don't know uh, this kind of stuff. They are freer in in their understanding of sexuality. They are more acceptive to uh, to sexual diversity and in, in this kind of stuff. So, will he target those audiences and and the audiences that appreciated that argument? They are going away. So, yeah, I think the change is coming anyway, right? Well, hopefully so. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Um, I have a question about the media coverage that you read. Um, the things that I've had, you showed that in a lot of the court decisions, uh, they use language that really like, seems to reduce the seriousness of other crimes. And I'm just wondering if the media, do they frame the violence as hate crimes, or are they just kind of Mm. Well, you see, these are these were five thousand uh, newspaper articles, and from all over Russia, from small towns and and the capitals and e everywhere, and so they're so different. 
right? They they are they are very different in in in, in every respect. You cannot find one way of reporting uh, those things um, because the the the, s the sources themselves are, are are different, and the journalists are different, and the time is changing. So my impression was like uh, there was a, a little bit more diverse language before 2013, and it was diverse in 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 various respects, like. Sometimes they used quite offensive language, but sometimes they used also uh, well, kind of normal, mm, respectful language too. Whereas after 2013, media started to report those things in two polarized ways. One was uh, reporting, referring to sexuality always as non-traditional sexual, sexual orientation. So they actually kind of uh, captured and, and, and started to apply that term in media conversations. And the other one is uh, kind of always very accurate and respectful way of reporting it in uh, what we call in Russia liberal media. So media that are more or less oppositional to current political uh, uh, regime. So 2013 more or less yeah, made those, those, uh, those two ways of reporting firmer. But before that there was whole diversity. Even, you know, words that sh you shouldn't publish, they used it. Filthy words, like, uh, explicit uh, words too, and that was more or less. They thought it's normal. Uh, yeah, I just have a question because there was a neat little graph that you showed where you compared, I think, on the y-axis was like the number of crime uh, just plotted across graph uh, across time. Yeah, that one right there. Oh, the, the U.S. and Russia. This one. Um, oh, this one. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, yeah, sorry. The, the yeah. That one right there. Yeah. And you do expect uh, do you, do you expect situations to get better, uh, but with uh, do you, do you expect the court trend uh, the, the trend that you grab by court data to to sort of go up again as uh, so more and more data become available? Yeah. Well, it's possible. You. Uh, um, it's not clear. So. First of all, the other two sources are media, yeah. who definitely started to talk more about LGBT issues, including violence. So I if they underreported before, they started to report more uh, up to 2013, and maybe the, this trend reflects that, and not actual um, level of violence. This is one thing. Another thing is that uh, there's certain professionalization of um, of um, gathering of data on hate crimes in the NGOs sector. They actually their recent reports are very good. So I believe that previous reports are not that good, and this is reflected again on the graph. And so what we see in that graph is not again rise of uh, violence, but rise of profession, professional skills of NGO um, staff, right? Maybe, I mean, I'm hypothesizing. Whereas in courts, nothing major happened. Criminal procedure in Russia is still the same. The same judges still sit in their uh, benches, right? On their benches. and. So there shouldn't be anything but uh, actual level of violence 
maybe but again mm, how actually we can know that right mm, I don't know I, I these are my my feelings my explanations but maybe 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 you're right maybe this uh, rise of violence and it's reflected in other data and not in courts that's can also be an explanation of course there was one. Why is he threatened? Oh, so um, I think it's the answer is in that law on propaganda. So the law says that if you are exposed to information about queerness, about homosexuality, you may kind of consider it, right? And and maybe start engaging in in. Uh, homosexual, yeah, non-traditional sexual relations if you haven't. And that logic is the logic that uh, there is always this fragility of heterosexuality. Heterosexual men, especially men, are afraid, are very scared. Some of them, I mean, like Putin, for example, are very scared of becoming queer at certain points. They know that there is that possibility in this world. And what does it mean to become queer? It means to lose your privileges. It means to become the outlaw, the outcast, a, a, a marginalized person. And this is something that Putin doesn't want. He wants to maintain the power that he has, the power that is symbolically rep represented by his heterosexuality and masculinity, the, the, that particular image of masculinity, especially in the situation when that image is based on nothing, right? So he knows that his uh, masculinity and, and heterosexuality is fragile because he knows it from his experience. That's why he needs the, the law. That's why he needs to target certain groups to, to distance himself, right? I mean, uh, in, in this sense, Putin is uh, not also not a, a, a person, but a, a, a sort of metaphor, right? Uh, when I'm talking about Putin, I'm, I'm talking about a, a metaphor that represents the position of masculine heterosexual power in any society really, not even in Russia or not only in Russia. So this is what that position is threatened, right? And, and, and as a person, Putin as a person speaking from that position, he kind of conveys that idea. Maybe this is a metaphysical explanation, but you know what I mean. No? <laughs> Uh, I wanted to push back against one of your arguments that right. Putin is not very attractive. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> that that Yeltsin, you know, it's a real brainer. <laughs> All right, uh, let's move back after this facetious moment. I used to yes. be generation. <laughs> yeah, never mind. Uh, after you, you spoke of a generation that's gaining and identifies up with you, uh, citizenship that is more uh, can you open briefly, I'm not familiar with all of this, uh, put this in a broader perspective, especially with uh, Soviet Russia and attitude uh, towards sexuality in the broader historical perspective that this particular political regime might have had and what's happening? Mm. Well, I, actually, uh, an, another thing to, to say about the law on propaganda is also that it's a continuation of uh, the uh, crim the uh, um, criminalization of homosexuality in the Soviet Union, so, right? Uh, you might uh, explain it that uh, in, in this way too. So, uh, Soviet Union, starting from 1934, criminalized male homosexual intercourse, right? There was this article. They, they didn't criminalize it right after the revolution. So in 1917, 
the uh, imperial law uh, on sodomy was decriminalized, right? It, it, they, they revoked that prohibition. And there was even the ideology of sexual liberation and, and, uh, and sexual revolution, to which more or less gay liberation fit. It's not really clear. Well, uh, uh, the, the Soviets, the uh, Bolshevik government did discuss possibility of same-sex marriages, right? And, and we, there are two or three same-sex marriages uh, that happened in 1920s between women. But eventually they came to the idea that it's better to control sexuality, it's better to, uh, to stigmatize male homosexuality and to medicalize uh, lesbian sexuality, right, in, in, in the mid-30s, when there was a major backlash. They also prohibited abortion and, uh, in the same period. They uh, restricted divorce. So they, that, there was that, and, and, and it was for, for ages until the collapse of the USSR, when in 1993, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, Article 121 on, on uh, male homosexuality was uh, eventually finally lifted, right? So uh, the whole, almost uh, during the whole Soviet era, homosexuality was criminalized, and, and, and people who were still there, queer, queer people who were still there, they uh, had to uh, create underground community to uh, to still have the opportunity to meet each other and 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 develop a relationship right and and maybe because of that we also didn't have and probably still don't a big and and effective and and uh, efficient LGBT movement, LGBT identities, right? We, because of that underground culture, because of that uh, lack of thinking about it, developing sexuality, developing identity, uh, speaking the, the ling linguistic categories that we don't have, we, sexuality is just there but it's not fortified in identity that can bring political action into into the picture and that was also uh, in the 1990s when you know so Soviet Union collapsed and all the restrictions were lifted including on you know talking about various sorts of sexualities, homosexuality, not only homosexuality, just any sexuality. And then in, in those particularly, in the 1990s, sexuality eventually came to be associated with major disorder, with like, you know, like it was everywhere. It, have, have you been to, to Russia in the 1990s? Uh, but I'm sure you, you, you've seen that, you know, naked women and men, they were like everywhere. In, in every newspaper stand, you, you would have newspapers that, are that were very respectable in the Soviet Union and that are again very respectable now that would advertise themselves through posting naked bodies on their um, covers and only that. Right? And I'm not saying it's good or bad. I personally, maybe enjoy it, but uh, people thought that it has to end, right? And they supported these new uh, ideas with which Putin came. He came and said, "Okay, I will give you order. 
I will give you dictatorship of law. And this is what he said, dictatorship of law. It's not exactly what happened, but he, his administration, his uh, people, they created a sort of uh, impression that, that, yes, this is what happened, that there is more order now, including in sexual sphere. And these orderly sexualities, like queer sexuality, was eventually criminalized. And isn't it the same that happened in 1934? More or less the same logic was applied. Okay, we have this crazy revolution. What? What? Let's let's stop it. Let's put more order into our society. We can't continue like that anymore. We need more order, right? And here comes Stalinism. <laughs> maybe, maybe this is the sort of of the uh, of the situation that is that is or logic that is now uh, repeated and that is doomed to fail also just like Stalinism and Soviet project mm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was wondering how the violence in Chechnya uh, impacted portrayals of hate crimes either in media or in law courts um, or how there was a government it's very interesting that the government actually responded initially quite positively. So they said, oh, yes, it's a, it's a big problem. Let's start investigation. And there were all sorts of people sent to Chechnya, like the um, human ombudsman, ombudswoman, uh, when they're very uh, important investigator, we, we have this FBI, right, this uh, investigation committee that investigates major crimes and one of the best investigators who actually um, specializes on Chechnya was sent to Chechnya and so there was the impression that they want to do something about it. But then uh, two months later uh, this wonderful investigator was replaced by someone else who didn't do anything and the ombudswoman just you know continued to reassure that something will be done but never did anything uh, they claimed that the they didn't have actual victims who reported their cri the, the crimes against them so uh, they couldn't do anything because of that, but then one of the victims came uh, up and, and uh, reported the crime uh, and still they didn't do anything and actually a couple of weeks ago they closed the case of that particular victim. Now there is the international procedure that is uh, going to happen and, it, and is happening related to that case. And will it be somehow different? Well, I guess not. But important thing to understand here is that they still want to uh, keep the impression that they are doing something. So they, they're not saying, this all is bullshit. No, we are not going to do anything about it. No, they don't say that. They say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's kind of important thing. Yeah, we'll look into it and then do nothing. So there is that ambiguity with the Russian government, right? But in general, it produces no impact after all, right? But we'll see. <laughs> I think it's very specific view, and and there are two explanation to that. First is that, you know, sometimes uh, people tend to 
not see the obvious. And in relation to LGBT, it's a long-standing tradition. You know, uh, I, I, I think it was uh, uh, my mother who just ignored that I have a same-sex partner and kept, kept asking me, when are you going to marry and when are you going to have kids and, and, and uh, assuming, despite the obvious, that I was a heterosexual. And that's a very, it's like Freddie Mercury, like everybody was convinced that he's a heterosexual person. And there are still many people out there who think so, despite the obvious. So there is that. But there is also the fragmentation of uh, circulation of information in Russia. So if that particular guy or whoever is from more or less conservative pro-government uh, what I say, group, community, right? Then probably he just doesn't read those newspapers, those magazines that report on that kind of things. Because uh, the, the, the whole incident was revealed for the first time in a very, very, very popular newspaper, a Nova Gazeta. Many people read it in Russia. But probably all those people who read that newspaper belong to a certain fragment of society that is not related to a different fragment of society. Russian society is polarized. We have to recognize that, right? So maybe maybe he actually doesn't know, but I would doubt that. I think it was everywhere. Even Rasiska Gazeta reported something, which is the governmental newspaper. So maybe there's this first explanation is more convincing. <laughs> yeah. I remember reading about this group who would basically fish gay men to a date and then they would torture them and right. video them. I don't remember the name. But they were like a, they were giving international prayer for that. What was Russian public's reaction? And, they, and did the government take an action against that group? Because I don't remember giving what an action. Yeah, there was, uh, they called themselves Occupy Pedophilia, maybe. Uh, first of all, the. Um, the guy who inspired that movement was uh, arrested actually quite um, quite fast uh, and he's still in prison so the government well the law enforcement they took some actions and uh, I have many cases uh, of regional occupied pedophilia groups that targeted not pedophiles because when they targeted pedophiles they took the cases away and this is not just my uh, field right but when they targeted just gay men uh, they are included in my database and they are uh, they were also brought to justice in various ways in some regions they uh, got a lot of years of imprisonment and the sentences, I think, were just. In other, pre uh, in other regions, uh, people were convicted, found guilty, right? But uh, released in the courtroom for various procedural reasons. So in different regions, it was different. But still, eventually, that movement uh, disappeared because of these actions of, the, of law enforcement, I think. Mostly. Unless there are any other burning questions. No. <laughs> uh, I think this is, I think, something I read about, but I'm not positive it's correct. But uh, in the 90s, at least, there was uh, sort of HIV AIDS in Russia and in Eastern Europe in general was somewhat of an incredible problem. Mm -hmm. Did that affect? like public perception of queer identities in the same way that it did in the US, or did it have a different reaction? It did uh, affect public opinion and public perception a lot, but in the Soviet Union. So uh, an another one of my projects, I read uh, uh, magazine Agonyok, Journal Agonyok, 
it's uh, well the little fire of rev of the revolution right Aganyok uh, is uh, a, a magazine for young people in the Soviet Union it was published from 1920s to it's still published and uh, I read only uh, articles about uh, queer people there they start to write intensively in the end of 1980s uh, starting from 1987 uh, and uh, Basically, 99% of what they cover is HIV issues. And this is how I think this topic came to the attention of, of the Soviet people first and then of, of the Russian people. And uh, all the articles are written in kind of compassionate way. So um, th there is that thing with HIV and LGBT issues in, in, in the Soviet Union and in Russia. Now there's another crisis of HIV in Russia and the numbers of infected people, people who get HIV is on the rise and it's worse, uh, worse in, in Europe and uh, like very bad I even in, in, in global context but there is no that compassion anymore and moreover well, what the government offers is uh, religious uh, way to deal with uh, HIV and yeah, they promote to abstain from sexual relationships at all and this is how you uh, prevent HIV and other STD, right? So the solution is very bad, and if if no other ideas will be uh, promoted through the Ministry of Health, it's uh, it's it's not going to be good uh, in in forthcoming years. The the thing is really 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 bad. Also because of the sanctions because the treatment that people get and produced in Russia is not very well developed so before the sanctions we had different treatment and uh, it was just produced not in Russia now we don't have access to that and, and this is another layer of this problem that I'm afraid will not be discussed uh, anywhere uh, in, in more details because of the uh, other issues related to HIV that we have. So there is that. And maybe it will produce new, new outbursts of compassion too. We'll see. I, I want to stay positive always. <laughs>